Andy Leonard is a data philosopher at Enterprise Data and Analytics, a BML Business Intelligence Markup Language Developer, and BML Hero, SSIS Architect, Consultant, and Trainer. He created and maintains the DILM Data Integration Lifecycle Management Suite that includes tools and utilities for managing SSIS in the enterprise. Andy is an avid blogger and has co-authored several books on SSIS, ETL, and database technology. Welcome to our data podcast, Andy. Thank you, sir. I mean, you have an amazing profile as it relates to authoring and co-authoring multiple SQL Server and technology management books. I believe you have about like um, eight books in Amazon. What was it like uh, working on them? Wow. Well, thank you. Um, at, those are books that were written over the past decade or so. Um, actually, it's been about 12 years now in the making. And I was very fortunate. Mm-hmm to be asked by Brian Knight to participate in that first book. Um, It was the Professional SQL Server 2005 Integration Services book that was published by ROX. Mm -hmm. And I believe that book was actually published in January of 2016. You know, you hear the stories about folks that are trying to get published, and they include all of these rejections. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they send a manuscript or submitted a manuscript or a book proposal and they got this number of rejections. And I read a statistic somewhere that said the average is somewhere north of 50 uh, rejections. And I was sitting in my cube. I was working at down in Jacksonville with Brian Knight, mm-hmm. and he was my, my um, director. I was a manager. And he walked into my cube and said, I need some help writing this book. <laughs> Would you be willing to, to help out? Nice. So I got zero rejections. Uh, <laughs> and... Um, and I was asked to actually by my boss to uh, to participate. Now at the time I'd written, I think I'd written one article for SQL Server Central, doc, and I'd also been published in Visual Studio Magazine. I'd written a small article for them, and um, so it was a it was a huge honor for me to even be asked. And um, you know, then I was asked some more. It's kind of once that happens, once you get asked to participate in a book. Um, people realize you'll write, and, and they'll contact you and ask you to, to write some more. And I always like to point out that I think there are a lot of incredibly talented experts out there, um, you know, writing these types of books, especially in the Microsoft BI stack. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've always felt like a, a bit of an imposter uh, <laughs> among all these great writers. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think I read very well, and I – You know, I don't feel like an expert. I feel like a perpetual student. And so I I often joke that, you know, the it's actually uh, book number 11 is going to come out in August. And it's a short 100 page book on um, building custom SSIS tasks. Mm -hmm. Um, And then book number 12 is underway. It's uh, we're writing a a book for a press called the Bimmel book tentatively. Mm -hmm. Um, So we hope to get that out by the end of the year. Wonderful. And um, I, I keep telling people that I, I think, you know, for me, the um, that writing has more to do with insomnia than expertise. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> so I will wake up in the middle of the night and have this idea, and I'll need to blog or, or drop it into a chapter, or sometimes both. I, I do that a lot. Mm-hmm. But um, again, just uh, I'm just a guy, you know, learning just like everybody else. And I'm, I'm I'm very blessed and fortunate to have had Brian walk into my cube and ask if I would participate in that book project. And then also blessed and fortunate to have uh, editors continue to contact me over the years and ask if I would be interested in, mm. you know, in, in participating in a project. All right. I say that's a super cool hobby to write and read and share your knowledge. Because many people in the industry, what they know, they wouldn't share. They just keep it close to the heart. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I don't find that so much in the Microsoft technical communities. I, I think that's mm-hmm. a strength, especially in the SQL Server space. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's a, a, a very active community on social media. Mm-hmm. And I I remember it was years ago, but I was, I was more active on Twitter at the time than I am now. I... I have a, you know, I use Hootsuite to kind of throw messages onto Twitter about business and speaking opportunities and books and stuff. Mm-hmm. But um, I'm, I'm just not on as much as I used to be. And it's a time thing. I, I'd love it. I'd love to spend all my time there helping folks. But I, I watched Paul Randall mm-hmm. uh, one years ago uh, help a lady um, who had 
inadvertently uh, deleted her transaction log, and he walked her through. And it must have taken, I, I don't know, I, I want to say it took an hour or two, but he walked her through every little step and answered her questions. And it really blew my mind because, you know, Paul is a, is an expensive consultant, mm-hmm. and, and there he was, um, you know, helping someone for free, basically. And I just really took that as a um, as a really good example, I, and I, I think Paul Randall is a is a good example of uh, you know of, of what lots of people should follow. He's he's a smart guy. Him and Kimberly and the whole gang over there at Sequel mm-hmm. Skills, they're they're really smart people, but they're also very willing and open to uh, to help folks if they've got time. Mm-hmm. And I was very impressed by that. And I've, I've been fortunate also to work with Paul and Kimberly at Sequel Skills, delivering some training on uh, SSIS. And um, very much enjoy uh, every opportunity uh, that I get to work with them. That's a wonderful story, by the way. And I agree, yeah. And yep. it, you know, I I've run into people who played you know played their cards close to the vest, um, as you mentioned. And mm-hmm. you know, I just I just find that that's that's kind of career limiting. I know it sounds you know the opposite of what maybe it should be. You would think it would be job security if you're the only person that knows how to do what you do. <laughs> But I've just found more value in being known as that person who will mentor others and coach others and, you know, help train them and, you know, help share things. And one of the things that's it's done for me, you know, completely unanticipated and unplanned was it, you know, I think it helped build a uh, kind of a, a, a reputation or some, some mind share where when people uh, have an issue, you know, they may come and check check the blog posts first. And I'm this is we're recording this in June of 2017. Um, next month, July of 2017, I will have 10 years of blog posts um, out at SQLblog.com. So a lot of people have gone out and read those posts. There's almost 900 out there at the time of this recording. Um, not all of them are technical. Some are just announcements about products being released or uh, stuff other people have written that I find interesting. If, you know, someone blogs about SSIS or Bumble, and it's an interesting post, I'll often write a post kind of pointing to their post. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I encourage people to do the same. I, I encourage people to blog. Now, I've written several posts about that, and I tell folks, look, if I've written about something and it helped you or it helped you a little, maybe didn't get you all the way there, write a post about that and say, you know, I started here or, you know, I started at this other post and, you know, and here's what I found. Um, and, you know, stick a link in there. And that's a, that's a really good way to get started blogging is just sharing with others um, your experience and your voice. And, I, man, I encourage that because, frankly, I, I need the help. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's right. You know, I'll, I'll read what someone else writes and, you know, learn something from that. And, you know, I'm, I'm out here like everybody else, slogging through, trying to solve problems and build stuff for customers. So, you know, I'm, I know I'll run into the same issue you've run into. So I'm, I'm yep. encouraging you to blog about it. Mm-hmm. You mentioned SQLblog.com. They feature all the world loan exports in Microsoft SQL Service space. And one of your like uh, most common topic is BIML or Business Intelligence Markup Language. Can you share a few things about what is it about and why is it useful? Oh, absolutely. First, it's a huge honor to blog out at SQL Blog. Uh, Adam Mechanic dropped me an email, like I said, about 10 years ago. And he said, um, you know, we need some more content around SSIS and the BI stack and asked would I be interested, and I said, sure. And then when I, I went out there and looked at the list of people he had blogging, I felt a little intimidated. So I often describe SQL Blog as a bunch of really smart bloggers and me. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yes, business intelligence markup language is, is a topic that I write about a lot these days. It's used, uh, well, I will, I'll say what I use it for. First, first Bumble can be used to develop uh, SSIS packages and uh, multi-dimensional cubes and dimensions um, and facts. It, it's um, the new version that's on its way out. It's not quite ready yet. It's going to manage tabular as well from 2016 forward. And, you know, you, you can do just about everything in the Microsoft BI stack except reporting services. And um, I use it extensively for SSIS package development. Um, one of the books, well, actually two of the books that I've got out there that we were talking about earlier, 
our, our SSIS design patterns, we wrote an edition for 2012, and then we wrote a new edition that we didn't really brand with a version, but we wrote it in the 2014 um, era. And if you're using SSIS design patterns, and, and what I mean by that is you may have uh, a need to stage data for a data warehouse or, or copy data or, say, a reporting instance. Mm -hmm. um, you want to get that load off of your uh, online transaction processing or OLTP system and move that reporting load over to another uh, system. If you're doing something like that, you may engage a pattern that we like to call truncating load or, or we joke about it and call it whacking load where you'll truncate the destination and then you'll write an SSIS package that will uh, that will do that truncation, and then there will be a data flow that's just a simple copy. It's a read from the source right to the, to the destination and copy the contents of that table. And that pattern is very common, and, and what we find is um, that uh, another best practice in SSIS development is to create packages that are very unit of work, almost function levels. And so I, I advocate creating a, a package with as few data flows and really as few components as, as necessary. Mm -hmm. optimally, optimally one data flow, and mm -hmm. that means you're making one package per table. So now yep. you've got this scenario where maybe you've got 100 tables in your source, and you want to use this whack and load pattern to, um, to build 100 SSIS packages. And, you know, to do that, right, I would say. It probably takes you 20, maybe 30 minutes to build each one. And you may copy and paste the packages and go in and edit the OADB sources and, you know, do remapping on the destinations and stuff like that. What's interesting about BIML is you can create a pattern in BIML, and then you can import what I call the BIML relational hierarchy metadata from that source system. And you can loop through each table that you've imported and you can build an SSIS package in that pattern, that whack and load pattern for each one of those tables. And you can do it really in a couple of minutes once you've got the, the BIML code written. And it takes some time to get used to BIML. I mean, your first, your first project, it may take you, you know, 20 to 40 hours to really get your head around how to use BIML because it's a, it's a metadata language. It's an abstraction. It's code that writes code. And that's always hard. But it does an awful lot of the, the abstraction work for you inside of the, uh, inside of the uh, templates that, that BIML contains just built in. So once you get used to it, once you do that initial 20 to 40-hour investment, um, that's something you never have to repeat. You understand BIML, and you can generate a project like that with 100 tables in it really in, you know, in less than an hour. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very powerful because of that. Um, there are other design patterns out there that, you know, that, that we're certainly familiar with and others. And there are people uh, writing about BIML now a lot more than in the past. Um, you can join a community out at BIMLScript.com and, and learn more about it. Mm -hmm. um, and you can also um, participate. You can participate on LinkedIn. There's a group out there, a BIML user group. Um, there are forums out at uh, Veragence.com that people can learn more about it. And Veragence is V-A-R-I-G-E-N-C-E. -E. Mm -hmm. uh, they're the, uh, the shepherds of BIML, creators and shepherds of that. Great. And it's, I think it's a really awesome tool. Just I'll, I'll say one more thing, and then I'll shut up about it. Um, That's all right. We're, we're laser-focused at enterprise data and analytics mm -hmm. on, um, on data integration. And our mission statement um, these days is to build... Uh, data integration projects faster to to make management of data integration um, execution more easy or easier, and then to build faster data integration, which sounds a lot like the first point. But the first point is actually about development. The second point is about performance, and we find all three of these come together in the um, in the tools that we've built out at the uh, DILM suite. Um, most of those tools are free, and and some of them are open source. There's there's one or two out there right now that are uh, that we charge for, um, but we feel like we're you know we're developing a service or we've built a, a tool and a utility that provides a service that's a really uh, a niche especially for SSIS catalog management and um, so we we feel like we can charge for that because we've delivered enough value. Um, there's value in the free stuff. 
But Bimmel plays a key role in this, especially that first point, building the data integration faster. If, if you find that um, you're, if you find a design pattern and, and you find yourself in a spot like that staging uh, solution where you're trying to read from some source and develop a bunch of different SSIS packages that write to some destination, um, Bimmel is just the way to go. Now, if everything you're building looks and works differently, don't use Bimmel. But um, I find a lot of a lot of what we do in data integration with SSIS is lends itself to Pat. Got it. I might sound foolish, but can you help me clarify? Uh, is BML uh, supposed to be an alternative to MDM, or are they just totally separate things? So it is. It's a separate thing from from MDM. Although you know there are some components of master data management mm -hmm. um, that kind of show up in data integration, especially with SSIS, um, whether you want it to or not. <laughs> Um, one, one, of the, one of the things that, that you run into when you're doing data integration in an enterprise is someone will occasionally make a change to the source uh, schema. So maybe you're reading from an OLTP system and building a reporting instance or a staging instance and populating that, and someone will make a change to the source schema. Has that ever happened to you? Oh, and they will give me a, a notification what changed, and next thing you know, yeah. everything breaks, code or something. Right. Yeah. So it's rare that you'll get, you know, a, a heads up, hey, we're about to change this. Mm -hmm. um, usually you, it's, you're reactive because the data integration runs, maybe it's a data warehouse load that runs the next evening and mm -hmm. it fails because SSIS data flows are coupled to the schema of the source. Mm -hmm. So if someone needs a really small, innocuous change, um, which I would consider a master data management issue if you're making changes to the source schemata, you know, it, it can break your, your data integration. So if you've got a memo solution created for that, it mm -hmm. allows you, uh, again, if you buy the 4K product that Veritas offers, you can do some automation using mm -hmm. the Bimble compiler application, mm -hmm. and you can be really proactive. So if you've got a lot of volatility in your source schemata, people are making changes daily. If this is a, a valid solution, I feel. You could actually generate the target database for, say, staging or reporting. You could generate the, uh, the schemas, and you could generate the tables. And then you could also generate the project that would load, uh, the SSIS project that would then load that, um, that, that, those sets of tables. You could actually use Bimmel. You can automate it to, to have it interact with the SSIS catalog. And between the, you know, the automation and execution engines that are provided with uh, SQL Server, things like SQL agent automation, and then the ability in SSIS to run process tasks, which will run you know, um, executables and, you know, and, and the like inside of the Windows engine. You can run batch files, for instance, to still do command line operations. You can also call PowerShell to, to do this automation. You can actually deploy, you know, create the target database, schemas databases, or sorry, schemas tables, mm -hmm. create the SSIS using the Bimmel C, the Bimmel compiler, and then deploy that to the SSIS catalog and then run that project. And I've got an example of that out on a recording that I, I uh, put out at the end of March 2017 where um, it's a, it's a one-click example. So I, I, I push the button, and there's a stored procedure called and then an, uh, an SSIS application in my free framework, the uh, SSIS Framework Community Edition. Mm -hmm. Those um, two steps run inside of a single window, and in about seven minutes or so, it starts with five pieces of metadata, three connection strings, and two database names, and it collects all the metadata from the source and stores it in a database. It reads all that metadata into a BIML project, creates that destination database, um, creates the schemas, creates the tables, creates an SSIS package for each table in AdventureWorks 2014, deploys that project to an SSIS catalog, deploys the metadata to the SSIS Framework Community Edition instance, and then it executes that SSIS application and populates the database that it just created. And again, that's in about seven minutes of runtime. So it's I think the automation part of this is, is, is important because what we're seeing in data science and machine learning and, you know, the deep learning and AI engines that are awesome. I mean, at, as we're talking right now, the uh, Microsoft Data Insights Conference is going on, and I've been watching the, uh, the keynote before we, we got together this morning. And 
the, the long pole in data science is still what they call data wrangling or munging, and it's at least half of the work. Um, I've seen estimates as high as 90% of the job. Mm. So this is why we're so focused on automating data integration. If we can get that down, I mean, it would be a nice goal, and I think a very achievable goal, to get that down below 50%. And I'd like to see this wrangling and munging piece drop even farther in the cycle because it's it's hard and it's tedious. And if you don't like this kind of work, it's kind of mind-numbing. I, I happen to like it. Yep. <laughs> so, Same here. You know, so yeah, that's that's why we're so focused on demo and, and data integration, lifecycle management, and automation. We think we can get that long pole shorter. Great. I also noticed that you have a podcast called Data Driven. It sounds really exciting. Uh, what is it about? Wow. Well, thank you for mentioning <laughs> that, especially on your podcast, which is so cool. Um, Frank Lavinia and I began talking late last year, late 2016, mm-hmm. about um, producing a show where we would talk to data scientists. Um, we had both started working on the Microsoft uh, Data Science Certification um, Frank's almost done with it. He's done better than me. I'm still in the beginning stages of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it, it, was a, it was a cool idea. We were both just blown away by the advances that we're seeing across the entire spectrum. Frank and I are both Microsoft-focused just from, you know, decades of working in this field. Frank comes at it from a software developer's perspective, and he's also written a couple books. He's, he's focused on XAML and user experience and when you put that into context of data science, that's really the shiny part, right? The reports, the um, the charts, the regression analysis graphs, and all of this, uh, all of that is really the the output. And um, the part that I focus on is the, as I mentioned, the 50 to 90 percent of the work that's kind of the plumbing under the house. Yep. Uh, <laughs> but. Frank and I together make a really good team on talking about this because we can approach it from both those directions, and. So we've had some some really amazing guests so far on the show. We started off with Jen Underwood, and Jen is just just awesome in this field. She's she's a data scientist. Um, she's been doing this since before it was called data science. Uh, we followed that up with an interview with a um, with the, uh, a corporate strategist for McKesson, which is a Fortune five company. Uh, it's a gentleman here in Richmond named Nick Harris, and Nick talked about you know, really applying data science. And, and I think it was a good setup for the show. We're, we're certainly trying to, you know, go through um, uh, not just not just the geeky part of this, but the application part of this. And it was a, a good second show for us to do. Our, um, our, our fourth show was Donald Farmer, and Donald is, is just an amazing person. I don't know if... Uh, if you've heard of him or talked about him before. Um, I've seen his uh, Twitter feeds in the past. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Donald is, a, is an amazing person. He was actually engaged in the uh, creation of uh, SSIS when he worked at Microsoft. He was a program manager there. Oh, nice. Um, and probably our most popular show was a third. That's why I held it to last. <laughs> um, let me read. She spoke about bioinformatics, and, um, you know, she was... Uh, she shared a really interesting snippet in there. I, I won't do it service, but please go listen. Mm-hmm. Uh, datadriven.tv is our URL. But Lynn talked about a, a gentleman who was working for a bioinformatics firm that, uh, that did analysis on, uh, on DNA. And he was diagnosed with prostate cancer and was given you know, some limited amount of time to live. Well, since he worked in the field, he actually sequenced the DNA of his cancer, mm-hmm. found out it wasn't as bad as they thought, okay. um, shifted the direction of his treatment, saved his life, basically. <laughs> and, you know, using data science and, and along with bioinformatics. And I found that to be a fascinating story. Oh, it um, sure is, definitely. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, folks, again, folks that want to learn more about that, um, well, again, we're recording this in um, in June 2017. I'll share it with you. We usually don't let this out of the bag until mm-hmm. uh, until the news have been uh, released. But our next one is another great show. Uh, it's going to come out uh, tomorrow. We're recording this on the 12th. It'll come out on the 13th, yep. and it's with Mark Medeo. 
mm-hmm. and he is the lead data scientist with uh, MCS. Wow. Um, so he's out there practicing, and his, he's actually Dr. Mark Tabadillo. Uh, he has a Ph.D. in this stuff and has taught at Phoenix University, mm-hmm. and I believe that we mentioned some other colleges he taught at while a graduate student. Nice. So we're getting some stellar guests. And I'm I'm just amazed and overwhelmed. And you know we're we're looking for people. If people are interested, mm-hmm. um, they can certainly ping us. There's a uh, contact page out at datadriven.tv. Uh, some of your listeners who are doing data science or just like I said, working in fields around it, um, mm-hmm. even on the business side of stuff, we we'd be honored to speak to them. Heck, we'd love to have you on the show. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, uh i i really appreciate it i'd love to uh, uh, participate in future and also uh, mm-hmm. thank you for uh, recommending me uh, frank um we're talking to him uh, hopefully we can also have him uh, as our guest in in one of our future oh, podcasts that, is, that would be great frank's uh, frank's mm-hmm. awesome and um like i said super mm-hmm. smart published and uh, really he's got a, got his head around us and it's it's been, I've been friends with Frank for about a dozen years. Um, when I came, I moved back from working in Jacksonville, where I met Brian Knight. Um, I moved back home to the Richmond area, uh, central Virginia. I actually live about 75 miles out of Richmond mm-hmm. in a little town from Farmville, Virginia. Yep. Now, I have to tell people it's Farmville, not the game. Yep. Uh, yeah, I used to joke <laughs> with you about that. <laughs> <laughs> you did. And, uh, I mean, for a while there, we were raising chickens. Uh, mm-hmm. They were laying hens, not not uh, for eating. Mm-hmm. But I would used on social media that I was going out to, you know, water the chickens or feed them or something. And people, some people wrote me and said, you play that game all the time. And I've never played the game, I promise. That's funny. <laughs> That's but, um, Yeah, when, when I moved back up here in, in late 2005, I met, I met both Frank and Nick Harris, the gentleman that we interviewed uh, from McKesson, and we were all just punk developers, you know, mm-hmm. hanging out at a, a .NET user group meeting. And it's really been these lasting friendships that grew out of that. And um, so I've known Frank for, like I said, about a dozen years. And I, it was interesting watching him over the last 12 to 18 months. He really got this, this kind of tickle in his head about, about data mm-hmm. and data science. And I watched him transition. And I've, I've watched others do this before. Another mm-hmm. um, good friend, Kevin Hazard, yeah. um, I watched him years ago make that same transition. And Kevin is now one of the, you know, one of the best enterprise architects I know because he really does. He's he was a former C sharp MVP, mm-hmm. probably could have been an F sharp MVP. Wrote wrote the book Meta Programming, co-wrote Meta Programming in .NET, mm-hmm. and um, but he also really gets. Uh, SQL Server and just data in general, and when you combine that along with his microservices experience and experience with stuff I consider kind of obscure like sync, and, mm-hmm. yeah, and he's got he's gotten good SSIS skills as well. It, it's it's really cool to watch people mature and kind of blossom, and especially folks who are software developers. And maybe the reason I I enjoy watching folks go through that transition is I went through it. Um, I was an MCSD back before .NET, mm-hmm. and um, I, I made that switch kind of through the early 2000s over into data, and it's a big change in the way you think. I mean, yep. going from, you know, object-oriented programming to to um, to a language like, like Transact SQL. It was a big switch, mm-hmm. but um, we talk about that some on the podcast. We talk about... Um, things going on in people's personal lives. And it's very fascinating, you know, to, to do that. Much like you and I are bannering here about chickens and such. <laughs> uh, we have the same kinds of conversations. And I enjoy p- listening to podcasts that, that you know, do that. Um, mm-hmm. And I certainly enjoy, uh, certainly enjoy do, being the interviewer mm-hmm. uh, on that. I, I've, I've been a, a guest on many podcasts, and again, I, I want to thank you for having me on this one. This was a real honor. Yeah, it, w- it was my pleasure, too. And it was also my honor to collaborate with someone of your stature. And given that uh, how many uh, teamwork and book uh, book works you have done, that's uh, amazing. Well, uh, I, <laughs> I appreciate that. I, I, don't, I don't get it. I, I remember I had a conversation once at the past summit. Um, a young man came up to me. Um, and he was he was chatting with me about um, my presentation. He said, "You know, are you ready?" And 
how do you feel? And I told him I was nervous <laughs> and, you know, worried. I'd never delivered this talk before. And I could see this look of horror coming over his face. I was just dashing, mm-hmm. you know, his, his perception of me. And he, he stammered after I finished. He said, but, but, but you're Andy Leonard. <laughs> he, actually, he, he said Andy Frickin Leonard. I actually wrote a blog post about this. It's called Andy Frickin Leonard. That's right. <laughs> the legend. I said, I, I said, well, <laughs> I've been trapped in here with me for decades, and I'm just not that impressed. <laughs> so I always have that reaction when when people say that, and mm-hmm. you know, early early on when the um, when the first book came out, I went to speak at a user group, and someone came up to me with a copy of the book, and they said, "You know, would you autograph my book?" And I kind of laughed at them, and I said, <laughs> "Why?" <laughs> you know, That's cool. I'm just this redneck, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. Sorry, I'm just this redneck who yeah. you learned how to code. <laughs> And was sitting in the right queue when, you know, my boss needed some help on his book. Yeah. But I had a conversation with my wife after that, and she, she came down pretty hard on me. She said, you know, Andy, that was a fan. And I'm like, I don't have fans. <laughs> and she said, you know, well, who has fans? And I started describing some of my heroes, you mm-hmm. know, people who, who speak at the conferences and, and do this stuff. And she was kind of standing there with her hands out going, you know, that's you. And I said, well, Okay, maybe I am one of those people, but I really thought I'd feel smarter once I became one. Uh, (laughs) And I don't. (laughs) I'm sure it must be exciting um, uh, meeting or getting to work with somebody uh, whose book you have read. Um, One of my former boss, uh, I've read his book on SSRS. Mm, His name is uh, Brian Larson. And uh, so when I uh, went to work at his company, uh, Super Consult Consulting. Yeah, it was it was really awesome because uh, you've seen their work and example uh, in book and literature. All of a sudden, they're you are getting to work with them. So uh, I can definitely well, re- relate to that feeling. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm still that way. There are people that we've talked with on the podcast so far that you know Donald and um, a couple of guests coming up later in June. I can't mention yet, but I mean, you know heroes, right? They're, mm-hmm. they're my heroes, and I'm very honored to speak with them. And I can't believe they re- accepted my, uh, you know, my request to spend an hour talking about stuff. Um, and, and, yeah, getting to work with people. I- I'll tell you, I love being the dumbest guy in the room, and that's mm-hmm. really not hard for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do love going in, and because I, I'm, I, I'm not making this up. I love, I love learning. Mm-hmm. And I think what drives a lot of the, you know, the writing and the blogs and the books is I think learning is just a tremendous high. Mm-hmm. And I like sharing this drug, you know, if you will, yep. with, with my friends. It's like, you know, I, I'd love to love to share this. Look, look I learned this thing. Mm-hmm. And look how cool this can be. And, you know, it doesn't always solve everyone's problem. And I, I get that. But, you know, I try to be very careful about limiting the scope and try not to overstate things because, mm-hmm. I've been guilty of this, and I see others do this. You you solve one problem, and you feel like you've solved a bunch, but you really only solved maybe two or three. <laughs> mm-hmm. So try not to overplay that, you know, and just say, hey, there's, you know, here's this issue. Every now and then I mm-hmm. think I hit on something that's, you know, that's a really big problem. And, um, you know, I, I ran into this when I was trying to move metadata uh, around the enterprise for uh you know, practicing data integration lifecycle management with SSIS. So I, I built this, what I, I thought was a pretty neat little framework for execution and logging. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I, I was trying to move it from the dev server up to the test server, and I looked at it and went, huh, there's no real easy way to do that. you got to type a bunch of T-SQL. Yep. So I started working with, you know, solutions for that. And then the SSIS catalog came along, and I loved the mm-hmm. logging in the SSIS catalog. So, yep. And you know, there's a lot to like in there. There's a, a good, I think, a pretty robust externalization solution with environments and environment variables in the catalog. And again, it became time to you know move. Um, well, the first thing I did was I integrated my framework, my execution framework, into that. When I first heard of the catalog, I thought, well, they're going to do everything I'm doing. And I was kind of shocked to learn that they weren't. And um, so uh, Kent Bradshaw, who works with me at Enterprise Data and Analytics. Um, he and I spent a Christmas break uh, integrating our old file-based SSIS execution framework into the catalog. 
And it was surprisingly easy because the, um, you know, it's just the, the biggest difference is where are the packages, right? They're just not in the file system anymore. They're now in the catalog. Um, and as I started working through that, that whole idea of migrating data from that source up to, the, say, the dev source system up to, say, a test system, mm-hmm. I started doing that with my framework, and then I realized, well, part of the integration included migrating environments. Mm-hmm. And when I looked at the SSIS catalog's way of doing that, I realized there were just some gaps there. And I thought, well, goodness, i got to solve that problem first. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I stopped yep. the framework work, and I began building what became SSIS Catalog Compare. Um, I really need to rebrand it at this point. It needs to be called Catalog Manager because it mm-hmm. does so much more than just the compare. Yep. Um, it, it manages deployments. It manages scripting. And, and uh, you know, what I can do with that now is I can just, you know, aim at, a say, a catalog folder, mm-hmm. and I can write that folder and, and click, you know, script everything that's in this folder. And it will generate T-SQL scripts for everything except the SSIS project. Uh, for that, it generates an IS pack file, which is what you want to deploy mm-hmm. as you're you know, handing these things up through the life cycle. And yep. eventually to production. So, mm-hmm. you know, not only that, you can right-click a, an instance of a catalog itself and just script everything out mm-hmm. in that catalog. I mean, all the folders, all of the projects, environments, all of the literal overrides, all of the catalog environments, the references, um, what I call reference mappings and environment variables. There, there's a slew in there that's just not easy to do. You know, it's not easy to script that stuff out any other way. So mm-hmm. That's great. Well, um, Andy, I learned a great deal from you today. Thank you for uh, all of your knowledge sharing, and uh, it, it was a great honor to have you uh, in our podcast. In closing remark, uh, would you like to share where we can get to connect with you, Twitter, social media, LinkedIn, what, whichever you prefer? Absolutely, but first, the honor is all mine. Thank you, mm-hmm. sir, for having me on your show. This is a, a great honor, and I really appreciate it. Um, folks can, can follow me on social media. I'm uh, on Twitter. I'm at Andy Leonard. Um, I believe at LinkedIn, um, I'm just Andy dot Leonard. I think I was able to snag that, that link. I'm on Facebook as well. Um, I kind of mix and match. I know uh, there are folks out there who say, keep your personal stuff personal and your professional stuff professional. I, I've never been that way. <laughs> I, uh, I do business personally. And so, um, it's always a, a, a lot of fun for me to engage with clients, and I still do that. I, I run into clients. Uh, I, was, I was working for one last week out in Washington State, and it was the latest one, and he said, I just can't believe we got you to, uh, to come out and help us with this. And I'm like, well, I, I hear that a lot, but mm-hmm. I still do consulting gigs. I really enjoy them. Um, and, uh, you know, I have a team working with me at Enterprise Data and Analytics, and I'll often keep the team engaged on other projects. But in- Enterprise Data and Analytics is a good site to catch up with me. Um, the, the URL is E-N-T-D-N-A. So E-N-T like enterprise and then D-N-A like data and analytics. We kind of shorten that up. Nice. As I mentioned before, the data integration lifecycle management suite, that website is D-I-L-M-suite.com. Mm-hmm. And um, those are those are good. SQL blog. You can contact me through SQL blog if uh, you'd like to reach me out there. And as as always, it's it's always an honor to to speak. Um, you know, whether I'm presenting in person or whether I'm on a podcast such as this one. So I thank you again for this honor. You're welcome, and oh, we hope to stay in touch. And again, good luck with your uh, data science certification project with the Frank. And wish you all the success. Thank you, sir. Great. I wish you the best as well. Oh, thank you.